Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabiyyil kareem Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in Welcome back to Islam Intensive Islamic History Where we are going to continue looking at the history of the Muslim Empire But this week we're going back a century To look at the foundations of Islamic Spain So we spent the past few weeks looking at the Umayyad and the Abbasid empires And I had mentioned that at some point they split off into two separate empires with the Umayyads continuing in Spain while the Abbasids flourished in the rest of the Muslim world. Uh, and we said the history of these two empires now ran concurrently. So now that we're done with the Abbasids, we need to take a step back and look at Umayyad Spain. Because Umayyad Spain is a very important and glorious part of our history. And it's a very forgotten part of our history. Uh, it's sad to say that the majority of people, not just majority of Muslims, but majority of people do not know that Muslims ever ruled Spain. Leave alone knowing that there was a golden age in Islamic Spain that lasted for 300 years. And that during those 300 years, Al-Andalus, Islamic Spain, was the most advanced and dominant uh civilization in all of Europe it was the best civilization in Europe at that time we are looking at a point in time where the rest of Europe was still in the dark ages and Al-Andalus was a beacon of science technology religion culture and everything else and this is forgotten this is lost uh, most people don't even know it happened which is a tragedy really uh, you know, this is an important part of our history. Uh, it's also a sad part of our history because what you're going to see is that the Umayyads built up Spain into one of the most glorious empires in the history of this world. But after the downfall of the Umayyads, Spain fell apart so quickly that it was the first Muslim land to fall back into non-Muslim hands. Right? You know, in recent history, that happened to a lot of our lands. Uh, we're seeing it now with Israel, we see it before that with India. Uh, but when you're talking about 500, 600 years ago, the only example you could really give of that would be Spain. It was the only major empire that had fallen back into non Muslim hands. So it's really, really sad that we lost what was once the crown jewel of the Muslim empire. But it's important that we study its history, uh, understand what happened, benefit from the good and learn lessons from the mistakes as well. So let's get started with what happened. Uh, how did Spain become a Muslim land? And with that, we go right back to the reign of Walid ibn Abdul Malik. Now, if you remember, we stated that during the reign of Walid ibn Abdul Malik, uh, the Ummah expanded faster than any other point in history. Right? He had appointed some of the most amazing commanders of the Muslim army that conquered land upon land until the Muslims were ruling multiple countries across North Africa and uh, Asia. Um, and they also ended up taking over a part of Europe, that is Spain. So what happened? What happened was that uh, Musa ibn Nusayr, who was the chief commander of Walid in North Africa, he had taken over Morocco and the surrounding areas and brought about a, a strong sense of justice and re religiosity in those areas. And just across the ocean in southern Europe, we had the Jews and Christians who were suffering under a tyrannical king, King Roderick. Now note, Roderick is a Christian, but the Christians of Spain couldn't stand his tyranny and they looked across the ocean to see the kind of justice that the Muslims were bringing and they wanted that as well. So the Christians and the Jews of the uh, uh, of this part of the world, they reached out to the Muslims in, in North Africa and they asked for help. They asked for help. So Musa ibn Nusayr, he sent his freed slave, Tariq ibn Ziyad, uh, at the head of an army of 7,000 to, to assist the oppressed people in Spain. Now, no, I'm using the word Spain because that's the word that, that we know or understand today. But remember, borders have shifted a lot and names have changed a lot over history. So just like the word Syria today doesn't mean what it meant a thousand years ago, Spain is the same. Uh, 
when I'm talking about Spain over here, I'm talking primarily about the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which today includes both Spain and Portugal. Right, so this part of the world I'm talking about both Spain and Portugal. Uh, that back then they were one land that the Muslims took over and it was one country under the Muslims. It only became two separate countries much later on in history. So when you're talking about Spain here, we are including Portugal as well as we're looking at the ancient definition, not the modern borders. Right? So what happens, this story is quite legendary and there may be some exaggerations uh, in it as well, Allah knows best. Nonetheless, we will narrate it as it is known in most of our history books. Tariq ibn Ziyad, this uh, North African uh, commander, he takes his army of 7,000, they cross over into Spain and he has a dream in which the Prophet tells him that he is going to be victorious, right? And so he burns all of his ships. So he's forces have no choice but to fight they can't run away from the battlefield and they clash with Roderick's army of 100,000 and they defeat them this is one of these this is the strongest victory of the Muslims against a, a superior army since Yarmouk all the way back in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab when the armies of Khalid ibn Walid and Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah faced the armies of the Byzantiums uh, and, and, and defeated them you know, this is this is like 80 years later and something similar happens in Spain now again I think there are some exaggerations in the story because there are reports that the Christians and the Jews who wanted the Muslims to take over they sided with the Muslims and they joined the Muslim army and they fought alongside Tariq ibn Ziyad so 7,000 Muslims but more realistically there would be at least 10,000 people fighting on the side of justice right um, so that would make a bit more sense right uh, uh, compared to uh, how it looks uh, when you just say 7,000 versus 100,000 of course we know as Muslims 7,000 defeating 100,000 be iznillah is completely possible as anything is possible with the permission of Allah but just to be historically accurate it is possible that there were thousands of Jews and Christians in their ranks as well and that also gave them an advantage so the Muslims conquered very quickly and they took over many many posh, uh, parts of that uh, of uh, what used to be uh, the uh, Iberian Peninsula and they established Al-Andalus so what is today Spain and Portugal was during the Muslim t uh, land called Al-Andalus which was divided into provinces like Cordoba uh, and a few other provinces as well uh, and before that it was just called the Iberian Peninsula and they take over this land and they manage to expand their borders all the way to the the borders of France now this is interesting that France and the Muslims have always had it in for each other the Muslims of Spain were continuously engaged in a jihad against the French throughout this history it's like a back and forth back and forth for hundreds of years with neither being able to gain the advantage until the inquisition of spain uh which not the french but the christians of would hundreds of years later rise up and kick the muslims out of their land okay so the first governor put in charge of spain was musa ibn nusayr's son abdul aziz ibn musa and he ruled justly and people began to convert to islam and islam became established in that region however the early Umayyads, particularly Walid and his brother Suleiman, they did not give much attention to Spain. Why? Number one, it's far away. It's all the way in Europe. right? It's not a priority to them. Number two, they were engaged in their own internal power struggle. So we know that Suleiman was trying to, uh, sorry, Walid was trying to prevent Suleiman from becoming the next king and Suleiman was pushing back against that and so they were kind of uh, negligent of the greater empire as they were involved in this power struggle eventually Suleiman comes into power and he takes revenge on any governor or commander who was loyal to his brother and that unfortunately includes Musa ibn Nusayr, Tariq ibn Siyad, Abdul Aziz ibn Musa all of them suffer at the hands of Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik and Musa ibn Nusayr is imprisoned and tortured. His son Abdul Aziz is assassinated. Um, Suleiman appoints 
a another governor in charge of uh, of Syria. I'm sorry, of of, of Andalus. But that governor loses his. Uh, he doesn't gain support from the people who are very angry about what happened to Abdul Aziz because they loved him. He was a just uh, ruler, and so that person is quickly uh, replaced. And within a few short years, Suleiman dies. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz comes into power, and now for the first time in our history, Spain is given actual attention. Really, Spain is conquered in the reign of Walid. But it really begins to show its potential in the reign of Omar Abdul Aziz, and it only really begins to grow into its full potential in the reign of Abdul Rahman ibn Muawiyah. So it takes a long time for Spain to really flourish. It really struggled in the beginning. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, he did something that was unprecedented in our history at that point in time, and that is he halted the expansion of the Ummah militarily. Uh, he, he halted the military expansion of the Ummah to focus on the development of the various lands that they had conquered. So he appointed Sama ibn Malik as the governor of Spain. And he put him in charge of doing a census of Spain, of, of writing out and recording uh, the towns, the provinces, uh, the populations, the religions, the races, the languages, the rivers, the mountains. Basically, every possible detail he could get about that part of the world because remember this is an unknown land to the Arabs. They don't know anything about this land they just conquered. So Umar bin Abdul Aziz number one priority, let's learn what we can about this land so we can see what work needs to be done. And so this huge task is taken up by Sama ibn Malik and this forms the blueprint upon which the development of Spain will grow. That later Umayyads would have access to the information to know what Spain is, what are its weaknesses, what are its strengths, what is its potential, and they could grow it from there. Now, of course, Umar bin Abdul Aziz does not rule for very long. Uh, he is uh, killed after two and a half years through poisoning, and uh, his cousin Yazid comes into power. And then we know what happened after that uh, between the Umayyads fighting each other, as well as the Abbasids uh, fighting the uh, taking over. Uh, and so Spain basically is continued to be neglected right until the Abbasids come into power. So the civil wars take place between the Umayyads and the Umayyads and the Abbasids. No one cares about Spain which is all the way in Europe. Uh, the Muslim world is in a state of, of, of anarchy and Spain is as well. These new governors are coming in all the time. People are fighting each other and it's only when the Abbasids take over the Muslim world and Spain became a separate uh, country uh, that we have the rise of a true uh, civilization in Spain. So to recap, the early Umayyads, uh, they ruled Spain through governors, but they weren't really successful due to politics in both uh, Arabia and Spain. We know Sama ibn Malik and his successor Ambasa were just, but they were involved in the jihad against France and they were martyred while fighting the, the French. Uh, Spain was involved in this time primarily in a jihad against the French and this just went on and on and on for years. Uh, so the last governor appointed over uh, Spain before it becomes an independent country is Yusuf ibn Abdul Rahman al-Fihri and he is the last governor because after this, Spain becomes its own country with its own Khalifa separate from the Abbasid Empire. So let's talk about that because that's one of my favorite stories in our history. The story of Abdul Rahman ibn Muawiyah, Rahimahullah. Really, the story of Abdul Rahman is amazing. This is a story you could make a movie about or a TV series about. It's, it's really, really fascinating. So, what happened? When the Abbasids took over uh, Syria, they invited all of the remaining Umayyad princes for a feast to show that there's no hard feelings. And they hid behind the curtains assassins, one assassin for each prince. And while the princes were eating, the Abbasids had them all assassinated. Every descendant of the Umayyads in Syria was murdered that day, except for one, Abdul Rahman ibn Muawiyah also known as Abdul Rahman the first. So why was Abdul Rahman uh, spared? 
There are different narrations. Some say he was sick and he did not attend. Uh, most of the narrations say he was there, but he spotted the assassins and he managed to escape. So let's look at what this book has to say. Uh, by the way, it's Lost Islamic History, Faras al Khatib, or one of the main books I'm using for this course. So he says in Syria, most members of the Umayyad family were jailed or executed. One young Umayyad managed to escape the carnage. Abdul Rahman, a 20 year old prince, escaped from Damascus in 750 CE, just ahead of the Abbasid Empire, and began an epic journey across the Muslim world in support of help, in search of help and support after the rest of his family had been killed. His mother was a Berber, so he went to North Africa seeking help, and he was always just one step ahead of the pursuing Abbasid agents. Finally, he found help in Al-Andalus in the year 755, and here he established an Umayyad state with Qurtuba at his capital, separate from the Abbasid empire far away in Baghdad. His journey began in Syria, and it ended up all the way in Qurtuba, and this is why he was given the nickname the Immigrant. So. Fascinatingly, it took six years. For six years, Abdul Rahman is on the run. For six years, he goes into exile. He's hiding. He's he's changing his name. He's moving from land to land. The Abbasids know that he escaped. They have spies looking for him everywhere. They have armies looking for him everywhere. And he's moving further and further away from Arabia into Africa, trying to find support. His mother is from North Africa, so he moves towards Morocco, right? And of course, this is a guy who's on the run. He's, he can't just, you know, um, take a horse and ride openly. He has to quietly, at night, move from land to land while still trying to take care of himself. And so he makes his way all the way to Morocco. And when he is there, he learns that the people of Spain are not happy that the Abbasids have taken over. And the average person in Spain is still loyal to the Umayyads. And so Abdul Rahman, realizing that the average person in Spain is still loyal to his family, he crosses the ocean from North Africa into Spain, and he sets himself up as an opposition to Yusuf al-Fihri. A series of battles take place between this group of, of rebels, led by Abdul Rahman, and the governor, Yusuf. And eventually, Yusuf gives up. Abdul Rahman takes over all of Islamic Spain, all of Al-Andalus, and he declares it the new Umayyad Empire. And so with Abdul Rahman ibn Muawiyah, we see the rise of the third and the final Umayyad Empire. And this is the one that lasts the longest. We know with Muawiyah Rajulanu and his descendants, it was just three generations. Uh, with Marwan ibn Hakam and his descendants, it was about 70 years. Abdul Rahman ibn Muawiyah and his descendants would go on to rule Spain for 290 years 290 years this is a lengthy empire and not just a lengthy empire but a glorious empire that the majority of these 290 years is a time of productivity or of growth of development of really becoming a beacon of civilization that during the reigns of abdul rahman the second and abdul rahman the third uh which coincide with the reigns of Harun al-Rashid and his descendants, we see the Abbasids and the Umayyads at the same time experiencing a golden age. So the golden age of Islam actually took place in two separate empires at the same time. Now, you may ask that, you know, who do we support in this? I mean, this when you read the story of Abdul Rahman uh, and his family being killed and him going on the run, um, do, do you support the Abbasids, who were seemingly better than the Umayyads, but uh, at the other hand, they're murderers? Uh, do you support Abdul Rahman, who's rebelling against the governor and taking over his land? Reality is that's politics. That's politics. It, it, it's, it's never straightforward. It, it's always a gray area. Uh, politics is a place where people's hands get dirty. Politics don't, doesn't not necessarily have good guys and bad guys. Everybody sees themselves as the good guy. Everybody sees themselves as the hero. In the mind of Abdul Rahman, he is the hero, reviving the Umayyad Empire, uh, preserving his legacy, saving his family, uh, bringing back their reputation, giving the Umayyads one more chance to establish themselves and grow, uh, bringing hope and prosperity to, to, to Spain. The Abbasids see him as a, as a rebel, the one who got away, 
a man who took a piece of their land and turned it into his own empire. What's interesting is that the Abbasids don't pursue Abdul Rahman after this. You know, he's not in Arabia, he's not in Africa, he's all the way in Europe. They decide to just let it go. Right? The next generation of Abbasids come into power and uh, remember he spent six years on the run. So when he runs away, it's Abbas who is in charge. Right? By the time Abdul Rahman takes over Spain, Abbas has died and his brother has taken over. And the rest of the Umay Abbasids, they weren't as bloodthirsty as Abbas the Butcher. So they decided it's not worth their time going to Europe and, 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 and dealing with Abdul Rahman. They decided to just let it go. And both civilizations coexisted peacefully for the bulk of their history to such an extent that if you were living in Egypt and you wanted to go to live in Spain, nobody would say anything, nobody would do anything. You didn't need a passport, you didn't need a visa. It wasn't considered treason against the Abbasid Empire. Nothing. It, it just operated open borders. Right, between these two empires and it was during that period that our <coughs> golden age takes place so why does the golden age take of Spain take place when it becomes a separate land uh, my theory is that because the Umayyads ruled a very small part of the Muslim world they could focus all of their time and effort and energy and money into developing that land so the Abbasids had to deal with many countries at the same time. And often areas would go neglected and faraway countries would go neglected and rebellions would take place and smaller kingdoms would, would pop up. The Umayyads for the first few hundred years didn't have to deal with that. They ruled a relatively small country. Uh, all of the energy and resources went into de developing their country. So they could really focus on turning it into the absolute best country in the world because they were wealthy, they had decades of experience in leadership and administration uh, they brought all of that that they had learned in, in Makkah and in Medina and in Syria they brought all of that to Europe uh, and remember Europe was going to the dark ages Spain at that time was untapped potential if you go to Spain and you look around it's a land that has everything it really has everything to become a, a dominant civilization in the world and the Umayyads recognized that and they built upon it and they developed around it and they built it into this glorious, glorious empire. Abdul Rahman himself, after everything he went through in his 20s, you know, the murder of his family, going into exile, crossing the ocean, rebellion, taking over, he ended up ruling Spain peacefully for 32 years. From his mid 20s all the way into his late 50s, Abdul Rahman ibn Muawiyah rules over Spain and he uses this time to develop it. He develops it and it glows into one of the most glorious countries in the history of this world. That Islamic Spain now becomes a superpower of its own, separate from the Abbasids. So now, a hundred years, or rather a hundred and thirty years or hundred and fifty years after Islam comes into existence, Muslims are now ruling two of the major superpowers in the world, the Abbasid Empire and Umayyad Spain with the Byzantiums perhaps being the third superpower but again the Byzantiums were on the decline at that time they were no longer powerful as they were before Islam and this is a miracle this really is a miracle the fact that Islam grew that fast from a single town in Arabia to two massive civilizations that are more powerful than any other civilization in the world at that time across three continents this is unparalleled in history and this really should make us think about just how amazing the history of Islam truly is you know there's a lot of darkness in our history but there's a lot of glory in our history as well so Spain continues to grow under the reign of Abdul Rahman's son Hisham uh, he also uh, he, uh, he would rule for a long time in fact the entire family's reigns put together works out to 290 years. This is one of the longest uh, dynasties in the history of Islam. After the Abbasids and the Ottomans, uh, the Umayyads of Spain would probably be the third longest dynasty in the history of Islam. 290 years, this family rules over Spain. 
Hisham rules for eight years. And Hisham is someone who the history books look upon favorably. And they actually compare him to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. That he is considered a just ruler, a pious ruler, a, a genius ruler, a great man. The benefit he had is that unlike Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Hisham didn't have cousins trying to remove him from power. Right? So Umar bin Abdul Aziz's reign lasts only two and a half years before his cousins have him poisoned. Hisham manages to rule for eight years before he dies a natural death from sickness or basically he wasn't killed or anything like that. One of the most fascinating developments in the reign of Hisham is the construction of the Qurtuba Masjid, the Qadova Mosque. This masjid, the construction began during the reign of Abdul Rahman and it was a massive project. This is one of the most glorious buildings ever built by the Muslims. This building is so beautiful and so majestic that when the Christians eventually conquered Spain hundreds of years later and they were destroying all the masjids, they couldn't bring themselves to destroying the Cordova Mosque. Instead, they turned it into the Cordova Cathedral, which it remains till today. So if you go to, to, to Cordova today and you go to the Cordova Cathedral, you will notice that its architecture is Umayyad. Its architecture is Arab. It doesn't have the, the architecture of later uh, Spanish buildings. It has a distinct Arab look to it. And you can still visit this building today and see just what a glorious architectural wonder the Umayyads were able to build in Spain so, so early on. And this wouldn't be the last one that they would build, right? The Fatima the Zahra building would come later and many others as well, the Alhambra Palace. Uh, but this right here is the one that remains. This right here is the one that, that is still there right till today. It's a huge, massive complex for Salah, for, for there was a park there, uh, there's, there's uh, with, uh, a library, uh, a library way ahead of anything else in Europe at that time, uh, a school, university. It was just this massive complex that was truly a wonder of the world. And this became like the sign that the Umayyads were now the dominant civilization of, of, of Europe. That they had constructed something of this nature, showing their genius, showing their power, showing their intellect, showing their technology, showing that they were, you know, a civilization that was more powerful than anything else in Europe at that time. So Hisham managed to rule for eight years, and uh, he faced some opposition from his brothers who wanted to be the king. Nothing really happened, not like what happened with Umar bin Abdul Aziz or the others before him. Uh, it was more discussions and, and arguments uh, but Spain remained stable it continued to grow and it co continued to flourish and it continued to become a massive empire after him his son Hakam ibn Hisham comes into power and Hakam ibn Hisham he rules for 26 years and this is considered a period in which the Umayyads consolidated their power in Spain so, during the reign of Abdul Rahman and Hisham, they're still fighting rebellious groups. They still have certain lands ruled by the Christians, uh, which they are negotiating with and fighting with and trying to bring back under Muslim rule. Uh, they still have uh, pockets of rebels there and there. Hakam is the one who manages to take over all of Al-Andalus and bring it under Umayyad rule. And he rules for a long time, 26 years. It is another glorious period of our history. I just want to read a little bit about the... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll get to this when we get to Abdul Rahman III. But I just want to, to, to just give you some idea uh, from the history books of just how powerful Umayyad al-Andalus was. But I think I'll get to that when I come to Abdul Rahman III uh, because he's the one who really, really... Uh, his reign is the real golden age of our history in that land. So, ab after Hakam dies, his son Abdul Rahman ibn Hakam, if you are counting, this is Abdul Rahman II, he comes into power, another glorious ruler, rules for 30 years. So, you can imagine, if you were born in Islamic Spain at this time, you would experience nothing but a golden age. Like, if you were born during the reign of Abdul Rahman I and you lived for 70 or 80 years, 
it would still be the golden age of Spain. You would experience just a lifelong golden age. This is like one of the most beautiful times and places for a Muslim to, to, to be born. And really, you know, whoever was Allah allowed to live in that time and place, it was really a blessing to them. Uh, Allah had given them this chance to live in this glorious land. And so in the reign of Abdul Rahman ibn Hakam, we experience another golden age continuing for 30 years. He dies and his son Muhammad comes into power. He rules for 34 years. And notice that these rulers are ruling for a long time. That we not, you know, when we look at the early Muslim rulers, we're looking at like 10 years, 13 years, 5 years, 3 years. With Umayyad Spain, people are ruling for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Why? Uh, some historians try to, try to understand why were the Umayyad rulers able to live so much longer than in the other parts of the land. And there are many reasons for this. Number one, healthcare had, had increased greatly, right? So the kind of medicine and, and hospitals that were developed in Umayyad Spain were way ahead of what was available in Arabia 100 years before that. So that naturally led to a better quality of life and a longer life. Number two, there were less rebellions and wars and civil wars in Umayyad Spain. So because of that, the rulers went unopposed for decades. Number three, the people were happy. Because the people were happy, nobody was ever trying to get rid of, rid of the king. You know, if the king stayed in power for 30 years, no one's going to care because he's a good king. And you know, this really uh, refutes the idea that we have these days that someone should only be in power for four or eight years. Uh, I had this discussion with a Muslim lawyer a few years ago. And I explained to him that in, in Islam, uh, someone can stay in power for their entire life. And he said, but that's uh, tyranny. That was the word he used. Uh, he said, that's, that's tyranny. That's uh, oppression. Uh, and I was like, how is that oppression? If you have a good ruler that's working, why would you want to get rid of him after four or eight years and replacing him with someone who might not do as good a job? Right? Just because someone arbitrarily came up with that number. Why would you not want to live under Umar ibn al-Khattab for 10 years or Usman ibn Affan for 13 years or Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan for 20 years you prefer Donald Trump for 4 years uh, or, I mean think about it it doesn't make sense right Islamically this is what, what something I noticed as, as, as a pattern in Muslim history and I could be wrong but this is a pattern I noticed in Muslim history whenever we had just rulers for the most part, and for every law is an exception, for the most part, when they were just rulers, Allah put Baraka in their reigns and they ruled for a long time. And again, there's, there's exceptions. Abu Bakr and Umri Abdul Aziz only ruled for two and a half years each uh, for, for things beyond their control. Uh, but for in general, you know, people like like uh, Umar ibn, ibn al-Khattab, uh, Usman ibn Affan, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, uh, the Umayyads of Spain, Allah put Baraka in their reigns and they ruled for a long time. Uh, and I think this was a, a, a blessing from Allah to their people because they were doing a good job Allah left him in power for a long time on the other hand the tyrants the tyrants in general and again the exceptions their reigns are often cut short people like Yazid ibn Muawiyah and Marwan ibn Hakam and you know anyone who was known even Abbas the butcher Right, these individuals, they never ruled for long. They were what we would, uh, you know, uh, they were like in for four years, like Trump, you know, like similar reigns to that. That Yazid will come into power, and within four years he die. Uh, you know, someone will come into power within four years they are killed. So again, there, there are exceptions both ways. Right now we are experiencing some tyrannical rulers that have been in power for way too long. Uh, and we do know righteous rulers like Umar bin Abdul Aziz and Abu Bakr who only ruled for two and a half years. But in general, there seems to be Baraka in the reigns of these rulers. And the Umayyads of Spain, they stayed in power for 290 years because people loved them. And the lands were full of peace and full of prosperity and full of development. Nobody wants to get rid of a king who's giving them all of that. And once again showing that the monarchy system itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It really depends which family is in power. I mean, what would you prefer? Ruling, uh, living under the Umayyads of Spain or living under a democracy like the ones we have today that are failing us around the world?
so we have the first negative setback in the reigns of the of the Umayyads. So for the first hundred plus years of the Umayyad era, there's just greatness, right? Mostly greatness: Abdul Rahman and Hisham and Hakam and Abdul Rahman the second and Muhammad. This is over hundred years now of just development, and then Muhammad's son Munzil comes into power. He and his brother Abdullah fight over the power. Within two years, Munzil is poisoned by his brother, and Abdullah comes into power. Now, this is the first period of unrest, and this is where it begins to look like Umayyad Spain is going to collapse, like the uh, Umayyads before them, because people are not happy with Abdullah, and the reason they're not happy with him is because he killed his brother. I mean, this was something that never happened in Umayyad Spain. It was a land of peace and prosperity. And here we have a man coming to power to murdering his brother and getting away with it. So riots take place, revolts take place, rebellions take place. Somehow Abdullah manages to stay in power for 24 years, which is again an exception to the rule. In general, tyrants are killed or die much earlier than that. But in general, the Umayyads of Spain had a long lifespan. And Abdullah stays in power for 24 years before he dies. And the the uh, Khilafat of Spain passes to his grandson, right? So his grandson, Abdul Rahman ibn Muhammad ibn Abdullah, called Abdul Rahman the third, he comes into power. And when he comes into power, he restabilizes everything. He is a righteous man, a, a great ruler, a great politician. And his reign is considered the real golden age of, of Islamic Spain. Like, if you were born in the reign of Abdul Rahman III, you may have experienced the peak of Islamic civilization. Allah put so much baraka in the reign of Abdul Rahman III. He ruled for 50 years. 50 years. He built the famous Medina to Zahra, the Zahra Palace, one of the wonders of the Muslim world. He is known as the greatest ruler in the history of Islamic Spain. The greatest, unparalleled, that nobody in the history of Islamic Spain even comes close to Abdul Rahman. This is peak, and we know after the peak comes the decline. But this 50 year period, these five decades, is the peak of Islamic civilization in Europe during those early years. And this is really the most glorious part of our history in Al-Andalus. So let me read for you uh, from Lost Islamic History what the author of this book has to say about Umayyad uh, Andalus. So he says, The Umayyad Emirate established by Abdul Rahman became a cultural melting pot during the centuries after his rule. Right, so uh, the Abdul Rahman he's talking about is Abdul Rahman the first. He said it becomes a cultural melting pot. Why? You have the uh, natives of Spain, right? The, the Christians, uh, the Jews. Uh, you have the Berbers of North Africa. We have people from other parts of Africa. You have the Arabs, the Umayyads, and other Arab families that moved there. It's now a cultural melting pot. You have all these different cultures and different religions living together in peace. People from the rest of the Muslim world continue to immigrate to this distant land, bringing with them different aspects of their culture. In addition to this, large portions of the native Hispanic population converted to Islam in the late 800s and early 900s. By 950, half of the population were Muslim. And by, a hundred, by 1,100, remember we're talking Christian years here, right? 1,100, so this is about 900 years ago, only 20% of the population were Christian. So what you're seeing here is a rapid growth of Islam in Europe. And I think this is why re Europeans today are, are so afraid of Islam. Because this happened before. Muslims migrated to Spain just a hundred year or so years after the death of Rasulullah so some Muslims started migrating to Spain. And within 300 years, they made up 80% of the community. Through immigration plus conversion, 80% of Spain became Islamic. And there is a is there is a genuine fear that that is going to happen again within the next hundred years because if you look at what's going on in European lands today Muslims are migrating in large numbers to these lands 
they are becoming prosperous in these lands their culture is becoming part of these lands they are having an impact on every aspect of life in these lands and at the same time every single day people born into these lands are converting to islam so the same thing is happening the only difference is the muslims are not politically in charge the barakah of islam is whether muslims are politically in charge or not islam still grows and so because the muslims are not in charge the governments in fear of seeing this happen again they are trying to, to keep the muslims down and that's why islamophobia happens because this was it this was the history of islamic spain that they went from 10% to 80% of the population in a period of 400 years so <clears throat> the author goes on to say the arabs the berbers and the hispanic muslims combined to create a unique andalusian culture that brought together diverse traditions under the banner of islam even the christians living in al-andalus adopted islamic culture and began adopting arabic language arts and customs this influence of culture and language is still seen today in the spanish language which retains many words from arabic I find this very fascinating. You know, when you when you meet people from Spanish descent who are Christians, they have names like Salma and Alia, and they have many words in their vocabulary that resemble Arabic words. And if you had to ask them where these names came from or where these uh, words came from, they'll just say it's our culture. But what this indicates to me is that hundreds of years ago, their family were Muslims. The hundreds of years ago, before the Inquisition of Spain, these these people were either Muslims or influenced by Islam. So, Al Andalus had a unique culture. You really see, you know, if you want to study the concept of Urf and its impact on Fiqh, you must study Al Andalus, because the the Fiqh, the Maliki and Zahiri Fiqh that developed in Al Andalus, was pretty much based on the culture of that land and it was uniquely different from the fiqh of all the other muslim lands and this makes it a very important part of our history to study and this is why i like reading the fiqh books of the like of al qurtubi and ibn arabi because they were maliki jurists of al andalus during this golden age who really developed these ideas uh in fiqh and so we see the culture developing and this culture is a is a mixture of Arab culture, uh, uh, European culture, North African culture. It's a unique new culture that comes about. And it becomes such a dominant culture that in other history books I read, they stated that even the Christians of Spain became so caught up in Muslim culture that they began to dress like Muslims. They began to speak Arabic. And they even began to take second wives and, and indulge in polygamy. This is how dominant Muslim culture was in Spain. I want you to think about that. Look at how the world has flipped around. Today, Muslims want to imitate the West in our dressing. And that's not necessarily haram. Again, it depends on your intention and what you're doing. We want to imitate them in our languages. The fact that I'm speaking English and that, that's my native language. It's, it just shows what the dominant culture is today. Right, that most of us are monogamous because that's the dominant culture today. Flip it around a thousand years ago in Islamic Spain, it was the opposite. It was the Christians and the Jews learning Arabic, writing in Arabic, teaching in Arabic, studying in Arabic, dressing like Muslims, marrying like Muslims, following Muslim culture. Why? Because that was the dominant culture of the time. And you know, this really shows us the importance of culture that the dominant culture will influence the average person always the fact that that we speak english and we dress the way that we do it's an indication of what is the dominant culture today and the fact that the christians of spain and the jews of spain had to learn arabic and and and, and they dressed like muslims because they were in awe of the muslims that shows you what was the dominant culture of that day and age Another important point, Jews also benefited greatly from Andalusian society. Throughout the rest of Europe, Jews were barely tolerated in the Middle Ages and were constantly threatened. Right, so we know that the Christians of Europe used to oppress the Jews. 
right? They hated them. There was constantly battles between them. The Jews were a minority. Uh, they were often killed and tortured. And this went on right till recent history. We all know what happened recently, less than a hundred years ago. The one safe space that Jews always had throughout history were the Muslim lands. Because of our tolerance for the Ahlul Kitab, the Jews had a safe space at that point in time in, in Umayyad Spain and later on in the Ottoman Empire. So the, the Umayyad Spain became the land where Jewish culture and religion thrived. It didn't just survive, it thrived. People like Mamadots, the famous Jewish uh, Mamanaj, the famous Jewish uh, philosopher, he spoke Arabic and wrote in Arabic and he lived in Islamic Spain because what Islam did, it, it gave people full freedom of religion. So if somebody were a Christian or a Jew living in an Andalus, they paid the jizya and that's it. You know, they lived their lives as, as they wanted according to their religions. They, they, they could write uh, and they could teach in their churches and they could practice freely and nothing of Islam was enforced upon them. The only rules were like, don't insult our religion, right? Or, or don't preach to Muslims. Those were like the boundaries of, of, what, of, 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 of how far they could go. But as far as their own communities would go, and what they did is they developed their own small towns, like a Christian town and a Jewish town. They had full freedom there to just practice their religions as they wished. So in Muslim Spain, Jews were given the freedom to practice their religion as they pleased, as I just mentioned. And, integral, and they became integral parts of society. Jewish philosophy reached its peak in Muslim Spain, producing scholars like Mamanoids, who, was, who is known to this day as one of the greatest Jewish philosophers of all time. So really, Jewish theology and philosophy flourished in the Umayyad uh, Empire of Al-Andalus because of the freedom of religion that Islam gave. And now we come to Abdul Rahman, the third, the greatest of all of the Umayyads of Spain. The author says, the peak of Umayyad Spain occurred during the reign of Abdul Rahman III from 912 to 961 CE. 49 years or 50 years if you round it off. This is mind blowing that a man ruled that long and it was so great that they call it the peak of Umayyad Spain. During his half century in power, he declared himself the Caliph of the Muslim world. Although he did not have power outside of his peninsula, his claim to the role uh, uh, his Umayyad ancestors held in the 7th eighth centuries was meant to combat the growing power of the Fatimids in North Africa. The Abbasids of Baghdad by now were basically prisoners in their own palace under the command of the Turkish dynasties and the Fatimids were the real political threat that existed to both Sunni Islam and the politics of the Arabs. So, when you take a step back here, realize how far we've gone back into our history, we've now caught up to where we are with the Abbasid history, right? So, the golden age of Islamic Spain lasted longer than the golden age of the Abbasids. We mentioned that in the later part of the Abbasid Empire, they become puppet rulers. It's really the commanders of the armies Right, who are in charge of their lands. Furthermore, they lose Egypt and North Africa to the Fatimids. I will discuss the Fatimids perhaps in another video. Uh, they were an uh, Ismaili Shia dynasty that took over that land and tried to enforce Shiism upon the people. And so, Abdul Rahman, he, you know, until this point in time, the, uh, the Umayyads claimed to be the Caliph of, of Spain. Abdul Rahman the Dead called himself the Caliph of the Muslim world. Why? Because the Fatimids are claiming to be the Caliph of the Muslim world and they are Ismaili Shias. So, you know, he he's fighting for Sunni orthodoxy here. He can't rely on the Abbasids to do anything because at this point in time, the Abbasids ha are useless. Right? To, to be blunt, the Abbasids are now absolutely useless and they would remain like that for the rest of the history. That although the Abbasid Empire technically lasts for hundreds of years longer than the Umayyad Empire, they're just puppets. They don't have any power. So it falls on Abdul Rahman to really show the power and the authority of Sunni civilization. And so he calls himself the Caliph of the Muslim world. And he sets himself up as a rival to the Fatimids. And he develops his land into the most glorious country in the entire world at that time. That really during the reign of Abdul Rahman III, 
Islamic Spain becomes the most powerful and glorious and developed country in the entire world. It is now the peak of human civilization at that time. Why? What did he do? Well, listen to, to some of the accomplishments of Abdul Rahman III to truly understand what a peak of civilization the Muslims had reached at this point. And by the way, this is like 300 years after the death of Rasulullah So we're now 300 years after the death of Rasulullah And Umayyad Spain is now the peak of human civilization Really, you know, whenever I read this or study this I want to just like jump in a time machine And go back and live in that world To go back and just live in, in, the, in, in Umayyad Spain under Abdul Rahman Listen to, 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 to the developments Abdul Rahman III Was a true patron of the arts and science Parallel to Ma'amun al-Rashid and Suleiman the Magnificent. So, there are three or four rulers in our history who are primarily responsible for the developments of arts and science. Harun al-Rashid and his son Ma'amun al-Rashid in Abbasid Empire, Abdul Rahman III in Umayyad Spain, and Suleiman the Magnificent in the Ottoman Empire. These are the four main ones who developed arts and science. Over 600 libraries dotted Qurtuba, the capital. Its largest library had over 400,000 books in a variety of different languages. Think about this. We are talking about the year 900 CE. And one city, Qurtuba, has over 600 libraries. Just one of those libraries has over 400,000 books. 400, that's almost half a million books in one library. Now imagine across all of Spain how many libraries exist at that time and how many books exist. And you really can see from that the priority that the Umayyads of Andalus and the ulama of that land gave to knowledge. And by the way, these aren't just Islamic books. These are books on everything, on science, on mathematics, on philosophy, on language, on, 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 on Judaism, on Christianity, on everything. Any subject you wanted to study, you could find entire libraries of books about it in Spain at that time. Shops were numerous in the city, producing goods that were valued throughout Europe. So it became not just the cultural center of Europe, but the economic center of Europe. That Umayyad Spain developed products that were in demand everywhere else in Europe. And so the surrounding lands had to maintain some kind of peace with them to benefit from them economically to get hold of these products through the trade routes it was a world-class city that served as a bridge between the underdeveloped illiterate europe and the great culture of the muslim world if europe's wanted to be educated they would travel to andalus to be in the presence of its great scholars and libraries even the leader of the catholic church Pope Sylvester II studied in Al-Andalus in his youth and, and was mesmerized by the scientific achievements of Muslim civilization. So I'm not exaggerating when I say this was the greatest country and city in the world at that time. At the time of Abdul Rahman III, Islamic Spain is the greatest country in the world and Qurtuba is the greatest city in the world. To such an extent that the Pope himself has to go and learn Arabic and travel to Qurtuba to study, where he is blown away and mesmerized by the, the, the level of, of technology and development that the Muslims had at that time. The rest of Europe, if anybody wanted to study medicine or science or philosophy or any of these subjects, they had to learn Arabic, they had to travel to Qurtuba, they had to study under the Muslim scholars. Islam really was, at that time, we can see what America is today. It was the dominant civilization. It was the land people traveled to to study. It was the land people traveled to to do work. It was the land that everybody else had economic ties with. It was the land whose language influenced the languages of all other lands of the world. Muslims at that point in time were the world's most powerful civilization. Sometimes I don't like to talk about this because it makes me sad. It really makes me sad how, how far we have fallen from the glory of Islamic Spain. In later centuries, when the first u universities opened up in Italy, France and England, much of their libraries were made up of translations of work from Qurtuba. So eventually, 
obviously people are traveling from France and Italy and England and all these other lands to study under the Muslims of Spain. They're going to take this back to their lands, right? And they're going to start developing. And so this is where the, by the way, this is where the, uh, the dark ages of Europe ends and the Renaissance takes place. Because what happens is that people from these lands travel to Al-Andalus and they learn philosophy from Ibn Rushd and, and these other great philosophers and they take that back to their countries and they develop it and the Renaissance begins and, and these countries begin to grow into what they are today. But it all started with them having to travel to the Muslim world, study in Cordoba, translate those books into Latin and other languages and bring it back to their lands. Islamic Spain was the main thoroughfare through which the knowledge of the Muslim world made its way into Europe, sparking the Renaissance of the 1400s. So I know whatever I'm saying, the book is saying the same thing. Actually, by the way, I didn't read through this before during this lecture. I just decided it would be good to read what another author says about this and how they like exactly what I'm saying, right? So I said that this sparked the Renaissance. He says the same thing. Kurtuba's magnificence was not limited to knowledge. So it wasn't just knowledge, it went beyond that. Abdul Rahman and the early rulers emphasized their power and wealth through building the most beautiful masjids and palaces, with the Qurtuba Masjid being the main example. Originally built by Abdul Rahman I, it was expanded throughout the 1800s and 1900s, becoming a vast building that could hold thousands of worshippers. It had a huge forest of columns topped up with two huge arcs made of alternate alternating red and white stones made up uh, making it an architectural marvel that was rivaled only by the Hagia Sophia uh, the Hagia Sophia in uh, Istanbul or uh, back then it was Constantinople in Constantinople so if you want to know just what a architectural wonder the Kurtuba Masjid was you compare it to the Hagia Sophia in, in, in which is currently in Istanbul which is still there by the way both these buildings are still around and you can see just how far the Muslims had, had advanced and how far the Christians had declined at that time. Unlike the paintings and statues abound in Christian churches, calligraphy and geometric design were the main form of, of artistic uh, impression throughout the building. So remember, Muslims in general did not build statues or make pictures of people. Our primary form of artistic expression throughout our history has been in geometry and calligraphy. And right till today, wherever you travel throughout the Muslim world, even right here in Durban, when you go to the most beautiful masjids, what stands out is the calligraphy and the geography, the geometric designs. It is, it is just something like, uh, you know, that just beyond. I said geography, I meant geometry, right? Uh, that was uh, that's just absolutely amazing. Verses from the Quran will be written in beautiful ways wrapped around the walls of the masjid, invoking the Islamic belief that the Quran was the highest form of expression and thus deserved to be in the most beautiful mosques. Architectural achievements also occurred in the secular realm when Abdul Rahman III built his palace outside Kurtuba called Madina to Zahra, the beautiful city, uh, and this would captivate visitors who came, any diplomats that came to visit would be blown away by the size and the technology and the, the architecture of the Madina to Zahra. And this earned Kurtuba the nickname the ornament of the world. The ornament of the world. So the glorious golden age of, of Abdul Rahman III was so, so, so amazing. You know, when I said this was the greatest city in the world and the greatest country in the world at the time, it's no exaggeration. It was actually called the ornament of the world. Of course, this led to problems. Anytime a civilization reaches its peak, what happens next? Great times create soft men, and soft men create difficult times. That's what happens. The decline begins, causing the collapse. So unfortunately, the people of Andalus, the beauty and, uh, and emphasis on knowledge had negative consequences. They stopped trying to expand into the French territories as they began to live more comfortable lifestyles. They became complacent and unwilling to leave the comforts of their home to defend their city. So of course, Spain became such a beautiful, luxurious, comfortable land that 
everyone becomes lazy so when invaders enter when people come to fight when people are trying to take over nobody wants to join the army everyone's enjoying the luxuries of this dunya the laziness of the population crept into the higher levels of society <clears throat> by the 11th century the Umayyads began to fight each other and civil wars broke out and eventually the collapse began so Abdul Rahman when he died his son Hakam comes into power he is the last great Umayyad he rules for 15 years after that civil war begins and the Umayyad Spain begins to crumble uh, Hakam's son Hisham comes into power he's too young to rule every city develops its own little government and people begin to fight each other eventually within the next 40 years the Umayyads are wiped out of the picture they just disappear from the power scene altogether and we enter the next phase of the history of Al-Andalus which is the period of civil war between many states and we will study that along with the rest of the history of Umayyad Spain next week so this week we looked at the glorious part of Umayyad Spain really where the Muslims became the greatest civilization in the world and stayed there for 290 years next week we're going to look at the darker part of our history where Islamic Spain crumbled it fell apart eventually it was lost the Muslims were massacred it, it's a lot more of a darker part of our history to study but it's just as important for us to study and just as much lessons that we can derive from that with that we come to our conclusions subhanahu rabbil islam wa salam al-mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh